Today, we're going to talk about what happens after the singularity. And uh, it's a bit more of a dissipated scope of talk to take people's minds off what other problems they have. And so a principle from Copernicus is that the earth is not the center of the universe and, and we're observers in a phenomenon that is unfolding and a participant, but not in control of it. And the earth is not the center. And Copernicus was persecuted to some extent because before his time, it was blasphemy to say that the sun might be the center of the solar system where the earth goes around that as opposed to the other way around. And sometimes the perspective of that you look at things changes how you see them. And, and the observer is really important in physics, and it's important in how we perceive reality. And so this is to get into realities. And so as I mentioned, what happens after the singularity requires discussing, well, what is the singularity and where do they come from and, and what do they mean? And a singularity is a term from physics from a, about 100 years ago that describes the event horizon falling into a black hole. And it's a mathematical term, and there's a lot of other uses of the term. But there turns out there's a lot of them in nature, and you can observe them if you look closely. But it's basically an acceleration into unpredictability and acceleration of change, primarily. And a lake nearby here has what they call a, a glory hole, which is the place where the water goes out. And when you look at it a certain way, it's, it is a singularity. It's the, the water is, is still in a lake right nearby it. But as you get close to the edge uh, of that, the water goes faster and then becomes turbulent and unpredictable. And what does it feel like when you go over the edge and you're going from a predictable, stable lake water across an event horizon of a singularity into an unpredictable chaos? And it's something that would be a fearful moment. And it doesn't happen like a light switch. It's not on off. It's a, a gradual process. And it, it might be over millions or billions of years or over thousands of years, but it, it doesn't happen in an instant. It's a process. And the mathematics underlying it is it's an exponential acceleration into unpredictability. And another place singularities are observed as, is in black holes, as I mentioned. And a black hole is closely related to a, a Big Bang in that it's everything starting at one point and then expanding out in an exponential way to uh, a wider, even vast expanse is what the Big Bang theory is about in that 13 billion years ago, where there was apparently nothing, it became everything in the linguistic way of everything, or at least the universe. And it's been expanding since that time. And as we get better telescopes and better instruments, we can look and see that it's bigger than we expected, expanding faster than one might intuit. But it is, it's an ex expanding thing that started at a, apparently one point, but maybe not precisely because it's not easy to measure that detail. So at the center of... of uh, galaxies, as we describe them, uh, most of them uh, seem to have a, a, a black hole at the center or a singularity point, which is uh, perhaps uh, related to being the attractor that pulls the galaxy together. And things fall into the black hole into unpredictability and various uh, discussions in physics over the last 50 years as to, well, what happens in, uh, inside the black hole? And where does the matter go? Where does the information that made up the matter? Stephen Hawking is famous for his theories about this, that the information falling into a black hole doesn't disappear, it doesn't go away, but it comes back out as Hawking radiation, which is where that the information is conserved and the matter is conserved and it evaporates back out. And the one of the uh, theories is the eventual death of the 
the universe will be to evaporate into Hawking radiation and just become a big gas. Another interesting theory is that black holes for us may be a big bang for somebody else. And we might be living inside of somebody else's black hole and that it's a recursive cycle that we may be having big bang. Our big bang might be similar to the experience of people inside other black holes. Not that there are people inside of other black holes, but just as a way to think about it. And so the, this sort of relates to as the Big Bang expands, it turns into matter and the matter consolidates and turns into stars and planets and galaxies and this sort of thing, but it also turns into chemicals. And these chemicals are, it can be viewed as inert, but they can also be viewed as more structured complexity of the information. And there's many different kinds of materials and chemicals in space and in the stars and in the space between the stars that they call interstellar space. And these are evolving to be more and more complex. And this complex evolution of complexity may be a pattern that is worth uh, contemplating. And so these chemicals are distributed throughout the, the galaxy and the solar system. And the, some of the matter congeals into uh, um, solar systems and planets. And some of those planets uh, have material continuing to uh, uh, rain down on them from space. And th uh, these are known as uh, uh, asteroids. And when they're uh, 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 seen in the sky, it's a meteor. And it, when it lands on the ground, it's a meteorite. And the rock in this picture is uh, a meteorite on the ground. The hole in the other picture is the kind of hole that a crater that can be caused by a meteorite that comes from space. And these meteorites are carrying the matter and information and, and they can land here. And, and where they come from is from out in space that where there's all of the material elements necessary to, for life or for carbon-based life have been found e either as clouds in interstellar space or uh, on uh, meteors or, or other things. The elements that make up life are, are common in space, evidently, and they arrive here in transport mechanisms like on asteroids. And recently, Japan had a space mission that went with a rocket out to an asteroid, and they landed on the asteroid. They drilled the material from the asteroid, and then the rocket brought it back to Earth. The main asteroid didn't land here, but it, it's the first successful mission to mine an asteroid and bring back the material to Earth, and it's being analyzed now to see whether it has the components of life. And these components are like the ingredients of the complexity of life, that there are many of them, lipids and amino acids and other carbon-based biochemical forms that I mentioned have been found in space and they're looking to see if they're all of the necessary components for the recipe to make life are, are identified and then how they're mixed together is a bit of a mystery, but once they're mixed together, it creates life that, the, as we've talked about before, is self-replicating complexity that then goes under natural selection that decides which forms of life survive and which don't. And so the complexity is increasing on an exponential scale. And in more recent times, in the recent few billion years, it's been increasing in complexity that we would going from a simple cell to cell within a cell, which is a eukaryote, to more complex multicellular organisms like worms, to things like mammals, but then evolving uh, intelligence that uh, adds to the complexity uh, all on an exponential scale. And interestingly, if you uh, uh, plot that exponential scale of increasing complexity of life, uh, you find on an exponential graph that a straight line takes it back, not 
just to the beginning of uh, life on Earth, which is four and a half billion years old, but all the way back to at least uh, nine or 10 billion years old, which is uh, almost as old as the universe. And so it's pretty uh, interesting indication that life is older than Earth and life didn't necessarily start on Earth, that it started somewhere else before Earth was fully formed. And it's landed here and, and is increasing in complexity. And there's no indication that it's slowing down or going to stop increasing in complexity that it's part of the origin of life that may be part of the origin of the universe and the origin of matter and all related to the same phenomenon of increasing complexity of information. And so how this works in a little bit more detail is, is our first chemistry and then the chemistry into a code that codes for more chemistry and then into more robust code that can reproduce and in, in, in a stable coded form. And so this is a, a graph of sort of the evolution of complexity of life going through chemistry, but then into multicellular organisms and then adding in compute or intelligence, which is sensors that sense the environment, memory, which memorizes the, the past, processing power, which is what computers do that then can take the information about the past and process it into the future, which we would call that a brain. And the brains are now adding more digital information like language and, and not specifically binary digital, but information that's not uh, necessarily the chemicals themselves or even the code, the chemicals, but actually virtual in that it's uh, neurons firing or not firing. And this evolves into increasing complexity, which would be just increasing complexity of life. And the life, uh, obviously, there's chemicals in the RNA, which are in the cells, which are in the brains, which are in the digital, but it's the digital form runs on a substrate. And so this graph is the evolutionary substrate hypothesis of how the substrate of what is life is increasing in complexity. And so the definition of what's alive is not just chemistry and it's not just digital and it's some hybrid of both, but it's really the complexity that matters. And it's complexity of information more than what the information is carried by. And evolving over hundreds of years now is a digital substrate which is now in the form of transistors, the silicon transistors that will likely evolve into quantum substrate, but it's improving at an exponential pace or evolving at an exponential pace. And this has been going for 120 years or so on this graph. And the interesting thing about this graph is it's an exponential graph with a a more or less a linear arrangement of, of the information over 120 years. But this is a, a graph of complexity. And the interesting sort of detail about it is that the, um, the words along the top of going from mechanical to relays to vacuum tubes to transistors to integrated circuits, which are, we call them silicon chips, is continuing up this exponential path of improvement. And as I mentioned, it will likely continue even as new substrates evolved or will evolve. As, and the likely next candidate going from integrated circuits into more complexity, more compute power, more speed and smaller space and more efficient function is first uh, three dimensional silicon and then quantum computation. And so there's no sign that this is going to slow down. And it's no sign that uh, here that it's dependent on the substrate. And so the complexity is accelerating or increasing. And, and it's a long term trend that's substrate independent. And whereas this is most uh, personally noticeable is the improvements of phones and the capabilities of the internet, and that they're becoming part of life 
too much sometimes, but the what defines a person is no longer the chemistry. It's no longer the biology alone. It's a person plus a phone is what's considered a whole person now. And that phone, if it's not attached to the internet, it's not a complete system. And these things are evolving what it means to be a person, what it means to be alive. And what it what is the information that's stored in the digital form in the internet and the phone? Uh, it's not really chemical, but it's it's not static either, and so it's alive. And and so this is tracking the evolution of thinking and and how brains have become more abstract in what they do over time. And so if you add the internet as another form of processing of, of information to a brain, the, it, it's like another evolutionary step in terms of the increasing complexity of the substrate of, of life here. And so what are the risks of this in terms of continuing forward? The one existential risk is nuclear war, where how we might all destroy ourselves or the climate might change so much on this planet, whether caused by humans or otherwise, that this complexity of biological life can't continue. And one of the recent fears that we've talked about is that the life itself might become AI and that the AI may destroy the biological life or other life in sort of an AI apocalypse. And so these are all legitimate fears that people have. doesn't mean it's going to happen. But what are other long-term paths that aren't existentially destructive, but might be a positive uh, outcome? And so an interesting observation made by Fermi, which when looking at life in the universe, is when, when we look out into space and other planets and galaxies and so forth, we don't see any activity that would suggest that there's a biochemical life out there. It doesn't mean there's not other kinds of information processing out there, but we don't see a biological life. And so this is so there's a phenomenon of where is everybody if all these things work the same way? And, and that it's introduced to either the existential risks of self-destruction happen and we're just like a, a breath away from that happening to life on this planet or there's another explanation that's consistent with the things we've just talked about and uh, and here's a cute video by jason silva about the transcension hypothesis which was coined by john smart about 15 years ago of uh, what happens after the Singularity. All right, so let's talk about probably the most out there, outrageous, cutting edge theory I have come across in a long time. It's called the Transcension Hypothesis. And it's what happens about 600 years after the technological singularity. Now, the Transcension Hypothesis by John Smart is an attempt to explain or to account for Fermi's paradox, which is the questions that asks, if the universe is so vast, if there's trillions and trillions of galaxies with solar systems, with planets similar to ours that had way more time to develop intelligent life and intelligent life that created technology and so on and so forth, why don't we see evidence of all those other technological singularities that might have occurred in all these other civilizations? And the reason that Transcension Hypothesis says the reason we don't see anybody anywhere is because complexity and intelligence eventually stops going to outer space and starts going to inner space and consider the iPhone in your pocket which is a million times cheaper a million times smaller and a thousand times more powerful than a computer that was 60 million dollars in half a building 40 years ago so you have a billion fold increase in price and performance and then you have this miniaturization that continues so when you consider the fact that 25 years from now trillions of times more intelligent computers will be a thousand times smaller than today's microprocessors you start to see that we have what's called stem compression space time energy and matter compression 
more intelligent, more density, more communication, more energy, less matter, smaller. And eventually, virtual minds living at the nanoscale and at the femtoscale will keep compressing space, time, matter, and energy into smaller and smaller dimensions until we eventually create black hole-like conditions and disappear out of the visible universe. And so the destiny after the technological singularity for all civilizations like ours is transcension, which is essentially to disappear out of this space-time reality that we know of into a black hole-like environment created by us and then slingshot into the future and meet every other civilization over there. Transcension. And another slice of that same perspective comes from Timothy Leary about 25 years ago, made this graph in his notebook that how there's more than one reality and the amount of realities, plural, that we're, we deal with per day is also on an exponential curve becoming more complex and more realities experienced per day where thousands or millions of years ago, people had a very consistent reality of living in nature and, and getting food and avoiding predators and reproducing and, and things were relatively stable and unchanging. And the uh, uh, advent of tools that have become smarter, you can uh, experience more realities per day than originally and the as for example a store of language allows the ability to talk about stories that are either a, a, a likely prediction of the future or, or just fantasy or fiction of, of an interesting story and the technology has enabled the number of these different stories that you can interact with is excelling accelerating at at it extremely uh, rapid pace where TV had many channels and each one is a story. It's a reality. There's sort of the reality channels and the home cooking channels and the nature channels, and you can switch between them. And so you can experience many of these per day. And then the PC gives you even more granularity to those. And the internet has, um, uh, billions of channels to choose from at any given moment, and you can switch amongst them. So you can take on the reality of of uh, of some show, or the reality of a friend, or the reality of of people in your tribe. And the humans have the capacity to deal with a, about a hundred or so friends that you know well enough to trust that. Each one is slightly a different reality. And so you're having, you know, when you're talking to one person, there's a language that you use differently than when you're talking to a different person who might be a different age or might be other things different about them. And so those are like different realities that you switch between from day to day. And these, the number of choices of these is increasing beyond the capability of the human brain. And so AI, in a way, is another tool to help you deal with more realities than your brain can. And uh, so this increasing of complexity and increasing of realities it continues unabated. And so that's where we'll switch to, to sort of conversation. And if anybody has thoughts or questions or, or, or whatnot about that, thanks. Hey, Reese, thank you. Fascinating as always. And just the last part that you were talking about was really something that I've been wondering about is how so many people are complaining about the speed with which things are changing. And it seems like it's a complaint without stepping into solution. It's, it feels like people are being left behind because it's happening so fast and all a lot of people are doing is complaining. What do you see is the trajectory from here, how we can catch up and not suffer so much. It's getting faster and faster. So it's, it's something to learn to not just accept or forget about resisting it, mm -hmm. but, and learn to accept it, but also embrace it. What is this rapid pace of change and this acceleration and how can these things 
be good and be better and be useful and things staying the way they were is not going to happen, in my opinion. Yeah. <laughs> and the change and the pace of change and the acceleration of change are a natural phenomenon that that embracing will reduce the suffering mm -hmm. that it apparently causes. And the trying to resist it is futile in a way. Okay. Uh, but the, many people to conserve the past and and have hope that things will always be the same. And if you assume that they even could be, that's probably will lead to suffering. Mm -hmm. So if you're trying to end all suffering, uh, you have to reframe change as good, not, not suffering. Thank you. Do you have a few people online with questions? We can go to Joe. Hello, Reese. Hello. I, I, I've missed a few of your talks, so it's nice to be back. And as soon as I start listening, my mind just runs off with you and starts being very creative. So I love that. Um, Excellent. Yeah. And uh, the creative thing is noticing today is that I work with the, I work with soil now. And the microbes and the fungal hypha and the bacterium and the protozoa and stuff, they all live in the soil. And I'm noticing that they benefit from the trees. They both benefit from photosynthesis. They can't do photosynthesis themselves, but by supporting the growth of something that can do photosynthesis, then they get fed the sugars that come out of the photosynthesis process. And they are, they are like, critical in, in, to the evolution of this next thing. It's for their own benefit that it's evolving, but then this thing becomes of its own existence. A tree is not a microbe any longer, and it is it might not even know of the microbes. And I then projected that as what's going on for us now. We're creating this uh, technology that we think of that is here to serve us. But what are your thoughts about that? And that's what you're pointing at. Oh, that technology is the thing then that will uh, become not us, just like plants became not microbes anymore, but they are their own thing. So you follow that? And what are your thoughts about that? It's a cool observation that the thing that's uh, alive is the ecosystem and the individual different kinds of organisms are like organs in the body of the ecosystem. And the, they're a varying complexity, but they're not independent. They totally need each other to be part of the, to be alive. And so the, the living thing there is the ecosystem or perhaps the soil, but even the soil it needs water and sunlight and other things to be fully reproducing in its complexity. And so the, uh, but it, it, this kind of uh, granularity works at many levels of abstraction. So uh, what's happening in, with the different microbes in the soil is, is an ecosystem by itself. But at a finer level, the chemicals in those organisms are a little ecosystem as well, where if you isolate any one of the chemicals, it behaves differently than if it's in a, a soup in chemistry. And so the, the complexity of that, it, it, of what's in the soil is actually very high. Um, and, the, uh, and so in the transcension hypothesis that maybe the complexity in the soil is what's going on other planets. And the evolutionary trend of that is to s increase the complexity, but not do that loudly but to be quietly underground, increasing this complexity with more information, more processing, more complex interactions, but more efficient than large animals clomping around, eating trees and sending radio signals out into space. And so the, one of the reasons why we can't see life or complex life on, on other planets is that it's very quiet. It's there but it's quiet and we may be in a very temporary phase of being loud and bold and, and inefficient in our complexity of things expanding and, and 
in scale and size and loudness and the energy spreading out as opposed to interior focus. So going athletic as opposed to meditative, where the meditative state may be the more stable state for an ecosystem. And, and that may be where we're more safely headed. Oh, that's great. Loads of fun. Thank you so much. And next we'll go to Yana. Yes, thanks. Thank you, Reese. As always, a very succinct presentation of very profound material and that was also uh, mercifully distracting. This transcension hypothesis, I never heard of it, but it also, I think, helps me put together the idea of morality when it comes to our evolution and why, for example, murder is bad because as you destroy a life form, you reduce the future complexity that is possible. And I wonder if that's so by re reducing the number of available life forms, we're, we're basically delaying this ultimate complexity that will allow us to become this greater consciousness that's going to join all the other great consciousness that's out there. I just, if you've heard of this. Well, murder is an extreme word you tossed in there that in the morality of murder is probably species specific in that if you take, for example, animals or creatures like, like a praying mantis, after they have sex and successfully breed, the female eats the head of the male, which like for humans, that would be considered extreme. But in that species, it's considered moral and normally. And, the, and so some of the things we anthropomorphize our morality onto life in general as to what is the right thing or the wrong thing to do. And uh, what seems to be uh, for complex life, the uh, thing that the moral is, does it persist? Does it reproduce? And other than that, all the other uh, moral codes may be uh, constructs of our particular species, but not necessarily universal for life. But I was talking more in terms of by re removing life forms, you're reducing complexity. Therefore, you're holding us back from this eventual state of greatest complexity. And that's assuming that the, the ultimate complexity is the, uh, it, it is the highest goal, and and we don't know <laughs> what that is, but it, that these are some of the conundrums that come up when you think about these things. Thank you. Speculations. I have a quick question just... along the lines of the transition that we were watching in the video, where the guy talks about how we went from expanding out into the universe to now coming inward, where microchips, like where technology is getting smaller and smaller and the human connection, the ways that human can connect will get smaller. And then, uh, and what are your thoughts in terms of people being able to feel and read each other's thoughts? And is that a direction that the singularity is going in terms of the human connection with technology? Or do you see that as technology being an impediment to humans being able to feel and connect each other, with each other? That's interesting that increased complexity can also be nuance and subtlety and refinement and like how, how precise something is and that it's not necessarily bigger, better, louder, faster, that the refinement of what is better might be more nuanced. And, and so practice is where you focus internally and focus on uh, subtlety and, uh, and fine movement and nuance are uh, equally valid, equally valuable as the more uh, bold things. And it reminds me of like the nervous system and sensory nerves respond to, for example, pressure, but they also respond to, to change. And so it's not like how much pressure and the maximum pressure you can put. It's like a slight change in the pressure is more interesting uh, than the amount of pressure, for example. And the change is something that you can experience like bunny rabbits. They, when they're at risk, they'll, some animals will run or will 
fight or whatever, but animals like a bunny rabbit will freeze. And when they freeze, maybe the, the whole ecosystem that they see goes blank, goes like white or black or whatever it is, but the, and they can see the predator um, moving because that's the only change in their environment. But if they're moving themselves, it's harder to compensate. So it's sometimes the important element of something is, is very subtle and very hard to distinguish in a complex environment. And the experience of the bunny is to make the environment still. And so they can put their attention or the thing that's valuable for survival for them is to put their intention, attention on the nuance of what's changing as opposed to the, the grossness that isn't a threat or that's a thought that is prompted by that. I have a question. Yes. I'm on video now. So a lot of what you said, I'll be honest, I didn't completely comprehend, but what I did pick up, and I think this is what you said, was that we won't have bodies, basically, and we won't, we'll be free from this third dimensional, the third dimensional confines of having one. And I find that just very, I'm like, it just changes everything. What changes that we age out of a life, it changes what it means to connect, to have connection with other beings. And Joe brought up about soil, reminded me of what would be our relationship to the third dimensional world. Will it cease to exist? Probably not. Will it actually be the answer that the environment is looking for us to just become sort of digital entities and leave the nature, the biodiversity alone and we'll just be out of the equation? But yeah, I just have these questions of what will it be like to age or to die or to have these really, these things that are really key to what it means to be a human. All those things just go away. Or overpopulation, what does that mean? Or does that not mean anything? So these are my questions, if you can answer mm -hmm. them. Yeah, so to tie it back to Copernicus, the, who, who before his time, would people would say the earth is the center of the universe. And, and that we, as humans, we think of ourselves, like my personal self is the center of the universe. And these other people are like accessories that make life interesting. But the, if we change the discipline where we're the observer of what's going on and try and take ourself out of the center of the existence, then we're, it gives a different perspective on the same phenomenon. And that it, if you think about our life and not being the, uh, the center of the universe, but being as an observer of the universe, it changes that perspective quite a bit, which is why I started with Copernicus as an idea to think differently about the phenomenon. But the like we're part of life, but we're not the only life. It's just our consciousness has to think about us as being the center because our consciousness is is thinking about trying to describe the system to us personally, or to me personally, not to us as a group and not what might objectively be happening. And and so that's a reality that we say, oh, my reality is this, but your reality is probably different, uh, almost certainly different. And the only reason that we have some sort of objective or shared reality is that we have language to say, we're all looking at this table the same, and, and we're going to agree certain properties of the table with language, but the when you have somebody who has a different experience of that table, the reality of that table has to change in the consensus as well as from my point of view, where I look at something from a self-centered point of view, and I realize that other people looking at the same thing see it differently. And so the, there isn't an objective reality in that case, or maybe ever, and that we have our point of view, 
but then there's other points of view are valid too. And when you have the language to pull together the perspective of many different points of view, then you have a Copernicus theory that maybe the universe doesn't revolve around me and maybe the sun, sun doesn't orbit around me, but I'm on a planet orbiting around the sun. And it's the same thing, but uh, the way you describe it is slightly differently. And so this is tied into ego and sense of self and a sense of other and, and that what does it mean if I die, the other people's realities doesn't necessarily disappear. It's just I disappear from their reality. And, and so the like life is from, a, from an ego and consciousness point of view it is very centric on me. But like life and information is not necessarily centered around me. And it's not necessarily going to end when I end, but my perspective on it might. And so the whether it's life and death is a construct that's an artifact of our consciousness and our, our self-centeredness. And so these are uh, topics that get argued about in theology over centuries, but the reality isn't what it appears to be. And there's at least one, <laughs> but probably more than one. Thanks, Therese. That opens it up a bit, for sure. Yeah. yeah. I'll be chewing on that. Yeah, thank you. And Russell has a question, looks like. It's just an, an observation or maybe just some humor in this, that when Copernicus said that the Earth was in the center of the universe, it messed up a bunch of religions and and shifted the, the paradigm of, okay, so how do we govern ourselves? And the residual of that is we're, I think we spend a lot of time looking for some external authority somewhere, no, somewhere outside of ourselves that still would be like, where is my true north to speak back to the Tuesday Sutra? And it turns out it's actually, we are the center of the universe. We just need to realize that there's a bunch of other centers, a bunch of other galaxies in the universe. That's the comment. Yeah, I left out the multiple universes part. <laughs> Good. We can. We should include those. Like, yeah. uh, a, a lot of our reality is constructed by our consciousness to have us feel better about what's going on, but the reality that we experience is something that our biology is saying we need to, if we don't understand the reality everything will cease to exist we'll get eaten by a predator or we'll not survive and so reality is as we experience it is something that we construct to better survive and then reality as we talk about it the shared reality is something that we depends on the group that you hang out with the, your tribe and uh, people talk about the reality in a way that so they can work together and be stable in an ecosystem that it is subjective it's not objective so it's like the different than Ayn Rand's type of point of view there we have a kind of dissipated topic to get people's minds off of whatever problem you were worrying about before and think about the Things are probably quite different.